Hello, Pillars students. This is your good buddy from down under, over yonder in Texas somewhere. I mean, I got my hat on, uh, trying to stay safe. And as long as I'm with Jesus, I'm safe. This is a special week that we're going to enjoy together because it is resurrection week. In spite of all of the struggles that our Lord went through, we're free from those. So we can curse the devil this week from all that he's trying to do. And I'm going to show you a little something that the Lord gave me several nights ago in the middle of the night. And I said, I got to wake up and write this stuff down. And I've written it down. Now, the Lord showed me what he does whenever we face these encounters that we weren't expecting. He always has a plan of evangelism. And I'm entitling my little talk to you today as game changers, life changers. And this is a pillars class. So we're going to be talking about the word of God. We're going to talk about faith and prayer and the supernatural. And if you understand what I'm talking about, that we're facing a demonic plague right now. And it's not new. Satan has done this periodically throughout the history of mankind. And the Lord always has a game changer that we weren't expecting as well. Satan comes along, does his little tricks, and the Lord always comes along and does something that just catches him by surprise as well as us. I think back to a game that I saw on television where a, uh, a fellow broke free and scored about a 50-yard touchdown. And he went in and the whole crowd, the whole stadium was in a uproar of excitement that he just took him ahead and everybody was celebrating. And then all of a sudden the camera, which was celebrating down at the end of the guy that made the touchdown said, Hey, what's this? And the camera flips and here is four or five of the other team running back to the other end of the, of the football field with the football. And when he crosses the ref who had not raised his hand saying the first, the, was originally a touchdown. He says, touchdown, the guy, and they showed it in slow motion a little later on the news media, that the fella dropped the football one foot short of the goal line. And the, the guys that were standing there with the ref, noticed the ref never raised his hand saying it's a touchdown. And then they noticed the football sitting right by the goal line. So they picked it up and took off the other end. And they scored a touchdown and went ahead and won the football game. It's totally a surprise, and it's amazing. I remember seeing another guy on a soccer man. It was overtime, and it was a uh, uh, everybody was kicking free, you know, freebie goals or soccer to trying to make a, a goal. And this guy, if he makes it, he wins the game. If he doesn't, well, the, he kicked the ball, and it's going like a hundred miles an hour. And the goalie jumped up and touched the ball just barely. And it hit the top of the goal post or the across. And then it went way up in the air about, I don't know, 50 feet straight up because it was hit so hard. Well, the goalie ran out saying, we won the game. We won the game and we ran past. And all of a sudden the ball comes down. And because it's spinning so hard, it rolls in and goes through the goal post. And so the guy that kicked it, sees it and the the ref says he it's you you won it was a goal it was a changing i mean i still remember in basketball a change in plans and when they developed the three point shot it was changed the history of basketball so anyway i just see that the lord does this all the time and he's got some surprises for the satan in spite of what's going on because this is passover week and we want to open up with prayer lord in the few moments that i have take this Use it for your glory. Share with the students, man, go deep within their hearts of what your plans are in spite of this terrible plague that's come upon the face of the earth. Already taken many lives, but you've got a greater plan. And I tell you what, it's going to be good when we find it, see what they're going to do. And I'm going to read you a prophetic word that I heard myself about, well, let's see, I'm talking about 30 plus years ago. And everybody laughed at this prophet. Okay, now you probably already know, heard about it as well. So I'm gonna tell you that a little bit later. There's a war going on and I think we all understand there's a battle in the heavenlies between the forces of good and the forces of darkness. 
And we know what this virus has done. It stopped the world. I mean, look at everything that's happened. The worldwide travel has been suspended. Layoffs are expected everywhere. Church gatherings of all kinds officially been stopped. Sports events have been canceled. I'm talking about the NFL, the uh, NBA, uh, golf. 400 sporting events have been canceled. The arts on Broadway and the cinemas, you know, they're closed. Education changed. Uh, so much has happened, and we're, it's even affected Christ for the nations. So I think you understand we're all affected. We're not affected. If you are a believer of Jesus, that's a curse. And we are pronounced curses on all things that come from the pit of hell. We are affected, though. And the Lord has words for all of us who have been affected and are being affected. Now, what's interesting is the soothsayers or, or the do, uh, doomsayer prophets have shared over the years, over the years, the end of the world this way, that way. And I think some of you have heard these different ones. 2001, the anthrax scare came upon the world. That demolic thing that killed people, bang. Uh, 2002, the West Nile virus. 2003, SARS. 2005, the bird flu. 2006, E. coli. 2008, Evelyn, 2009 and 10, swine flu, 2012, Mears, 2014, Ebola, uh, 2015, the measles. There was such an outbreak down in Florida that they even said it was the Disney measles. Uh, then there came ISIS shortly thereafter. Uh, 2016, the Zika virus, uh, 2018, Ebola, uh, 2019, another outbreak of the measles. And now 2020, the coronavirus, SUV, satanic urine virus, straight from the bowels of hell. That's what I call it. Uh, so the Lord has a few surprises in spite of what Satan is doing. And I, I think this isn't the first time that these things, these outbreaks have happened. If I look back to the 14, 1500s, and I, we know about Martin Luther, who was a Catholic monk, and then he the originator of the Reformation. He lived through the bubonic plague and the bubonic plague killed 25 million people throughout Europe, a deadly disease. And God had a plan. And I'll tell you that, but you know, the rest of it, here's what we learned from Martin Luther during that time. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. He says, then I shall fumigate, help qualify the air, administer medicine and take it. Uh, he says, I'll take medicine even. And then he says, I shall avoid the places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. And if my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. He wasn't afraid, but he took precautions as well. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it's nothing brash and nor foolhardily and does not tempt God. And this is in Luther's works, volume 43, page 132. So even the Bible has understanding for us today. The Mosaic law tells us, Leviticus 13, separate the infected people to prevent the spread of disease. So God gives us warnings even in scripture in the natural realm, not to mention the spiritual realm. Uh, the leper, if you have leprosy, you are to dwell outside the camp. And today we are simply to pray, pray start off praying for those that are infected that we know about. Uh, pray for the fear virus that is spreading faster than the coronavirus. Satan likes to destroy us by fear if he can't destroy us by the virus itself. And then God says, look, speak the word. I've given you power just to speak the word. And we see that in the Lord's own ministry. Several times he simply spoke the word and the people were healed. He didn't go and to the place where they were. He simply said, go and they'll be healed. So we can do the same thing because God's given us the power to be able to do that. If you know the word of God, it's down in your heart. Uh, back in the 1700s, no, the 1800s, there was a man that has an interesting little story to tell, and he's connected with our family. Uh, this was back in the 1800s. He was a pastor, John Alexander Dowie. And he had a case in his own home 
bubonic plague struck his pastorship. And he says 40 members of his church died in less than one month. Can you believe that? There was no cure at that time for that plague. And then as he was praying and crying out to the Lord, 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 Acts chapter 10, verse 38, he comes across and it says, Satan is the defiler, Christ is the healer. Acts 10, 38 says, how God anointed Je now God, how God's anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And he goes on to say in his writings, my tears were wiped away. Mr. Dowie said, my heart was strong. I saw the way of healing and the door there too was open wide. So I said, God help me now to preach the word to all the dying around and tell them how it's Satan who defiles and Jesus still delivers for he is just the same today. He did not have to wait long because within a few moments, two young men came bursting into his study, pleading breathlessly, oh, come at once, pastor, Mary is dying. Dr. Dowie ran down the street after them, not even passing to take his hat. He was furious that Satan should have attacked this young, innocent member of his flock. Mr. Dowie entered Mary's room and found her in convulsions. Her medical doctor, having given up on her, was preparing to leave. He turned to Dr. Dowie and remarked, sir, are not God's ways mysterious? The revelation that Dr. Dowie had just received from the word of God was burning in his heart and God's way, he thundered, God's way? How dare you call God's way? No devil, no sir, that's the devil's work. He challenged the physician who was a member of his congregation, pray, pray the prayer of faith that saves the sick. The doctor replied, oh sir, you're much too excited. Sir, best to say God's will be done. And he left. Excited? The word was quite inadequate, for I was almost frenzied with divine imparted anger and hatred of that foul destroyer disease, which was doing Satan's work. Dowie writes, there are many Christians who are Christians in theory only, and they are wor worldlings, worldlings in practice. They're from the world. It is not so, I exclaims. No one, no will of God sends such cruelty, and I shall never say God's will be done to Satan's work, which God's own son came to destroy, and this is one of them. Oh, how the work of God was burning in my heart. Furious at Satan's work, Dr. Dowie then prayed, and prayer of faith for Mary and the girl's convulsions immediately ceased, and she fell into such a deep sleep, so much so that her mother was worried that she had died. She isn't dead, the triumphant Dr. Dowie assured them. After minutes, after several minutes, Dr. Dowie awakened Mary. She turned to her mother and exclaimed, Mother, I feel fine. Dr. Dowie quietly thanked God and then went to the other room next to where Mary's brothers and sister lay with the same plague. After prayer, they too were completely healed. From that day on, John Alexander Dowie ministered to the flock to divine healing and continued to pray for the healing. And because of his belief in divine healing, he never lost another one of his church members. Came to the U.S. Listen to this. He started and founded the city, Zion City, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago, Illinois, where my dad was born in 1906 born in that city that he started to give credit to the living God. I've been up there, went through his house, his ministry, the church is amazing. To see on the back of the church, I've got a picture of it, uh, the choir loft, behind it was the crown of Jesus, a huge crown above the choir loft. I mean, it was like two stories tall, this beautiful crown. And guess what the crown was made out of? crutches and braces, all sorts of things that people had who had been healed took off and gave, and they made the crown of God, of Jesus, up there above the choir loft, choir loft where everyone who comes into the church, and it was a huge auditorium, could see this amazing uh, artwork. Well, this is John Dowie Alexander, where my dad was, and the Lord was about to do something with my dad who was born in that city and caught the vision of healing and has carried it to his dying day.
Okay. Okay. Now, one of the good things that's happened and will always happen when the devil shows up, God shows up too. And that's why I say this a game changer. Evangelism takes on a new perspective when God shows up. And I go back to 19, uh, 1860, our president, Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln, and we all know that he ended slavery and opened the door for equality between the black and the white person and what between uh, husband and wife, between man and woman. Is that, that, that was a new, that was evangelism right out of the Bible. The Lord, I could get carried away on that, but I won't. But I'm sad to say Satan was upset with what Abraham Lincoln was doing and he, and he assassinated him. Assassinated him. But the revival continued on with the black person and many of the black people went into politics and educated. It was amazing what happened after that, the freedom that the black person uh, took on and began to excel in so many areas of the United States. And now I've listened to a whole series by David Barton, a historian, a Christian historian, and he shares the amazing story of the black man ever since freedom came upon this nation for the black person. Of course, there's racism and racism will continue to exist all around the world between whites and whites, between blacks and blacks, between Hispanics and Hispanics. I mean, unbelievable. He's out to destroy us all. So that is a little lesson that we learned from Abraham Lincoln back in 1860. 100 years later in 1960, Another president that took office was John F. Kennedy. And I was there, I still remember when he became the president, I was in high school. And in my senior year, 1963, something happened. Do you remember what happened? Prayer and Bible reading was officially removed from the public school system. And I had that every morning all the way through high school, prayer and Bible reading through the intercom system. That happened on June the 17th. Dad's birthday is June the 18th, kind of interesting. But that fall, that same fall, 1963, you know, he was assassinated. It was so sad. I happened to be at the right place at the right time. God somehow guided me to see amazing things that happened during that assassination. I went out to the airport. I saw John F. Kennedy come in from Love Field. He waved at me, I took pictures of him. And then I went to the place where he was to speak because a friend of mine got me a tickets to be in there and to listen to him down at the, our trade center downtown. But then he goes downtown and we know the rest of the story. While he's downtown, something terrible happens. Now I'm standing beside a security guard waiting for him to come into the place where he is to speak. And I got a kind of front row thing. And all of a sudden I hear the walkie talkie on the security say, the president has been hit by a rock and we're taking him to Parkland Hospital, which was right next door. And all of a sudden, here comes the, the motorcade, all of the officers and the motorcycles and the president and something is going on because they just flew right by us and didn't even stop. And they went, oh, and I said, come on to my friends, let's go follow them. So we ran out and got in my little car, which was in a good parking place, took off and followed them, got into Parkland Hospital, which was right next door before they sealed it off, went up to the security and I mean, went up to the, uh, the uh, room where they let in all of this, what do you call it? Uh, I forget what it's called, but anyway, it's the, the area where all of the hurt people come in, the emergency room. Okay, so I'm standing there. And while I'm standing there, a nurse comes out and says, hey, you guys, we need prayer for the president right now. Of course, I didn't even know what kind of, I'm just uh, in high school, didn't know what kind of blood I had. I found out later that I had the blood for everybody that's good. I owe something, but anyway, O positive or whatever it is. So anyway, I saw the president just before, uh, just after he's dead, and then asked for blood. And then I went back home after the school, went to my school, and here was an ambulance picking up a dead person right in front of my high school. And who is it? Tippett, the person that was shot by Lee Harvey Oswald, the one that shot President Kennedy. And they were picking him up. And President, and he was uh, ran off down the street when a policeman stopped him. Uh, and Lee Harvey Oswald's house was right behind our school, so I walked by it every day going to baseball practice, and then they caught him in the Texas theater, and I met the policeman that caught him, and I says, isn't it amazing that his gun didn't go off to kill you guys? And he says, what do you mean didn't go off? I stuck my hand to jam the, the hammer so it wouldn't come down and fire. I said, that was you? Yes, it was. 
I was in all of these places. And you know what the Lord did in my evangelism from there? I would share this amazing story with uh, so many people and all the different churches and on the street, catch their attention. And I'd say, now what would happen if you suddenly died tonight? Where would you spend eternity? Just like he, like President Kennedy, catch their attention. I use that evangelism right after that disaster took place. Well, that happened in 1963 after he was assassinated. And then 10 years later in 1973, oh, what happened in 1973? The Supreme Court announced that babies could be killed. Abortion became legal. It's unbelievable. Evangelism. God had a plan though. So I already told you about 1963. And then in 1970, God opened up a school, Christ for the Nations, and you're a student here. And dad died on 1973, the same year that abortion became legal. On April Fool, first day, but the Lord had a plan for the fool. And that wasn't my dad, that was Satan. April Fool's Day is named in his honor. I want women to come into leadership and dad, when he went to heaven, the board elected mom to step into his position and begin to lead. And you know the rest of the story with her. If you haven't read her uh, little autobiography books that she wrote on evangelism and how the Lord used her, it's pretty amazing. I began to teach in 1973 at the school because I came back for the funeral and I began to teach. And I since then have taught 10 subjects Christian ethical behavior, discipleship, Christian evidences, and so many apologetics uh, and creation science, which I still love. And it's, and I've written 25 books now. I mean, they're not, I don't get the credit. I just happen to be in the right place and God used me. And it's fun. It's a hobby. And then I was asked in 1973 by Wayne Myers, would you come down and take a lead a, a tour? Youth with Mission and Price for the Nations. And I did. I led the first tour. Ten of us went down. And it was a life-changing experience in my heart that I'll never forget because evangelism took place in my heart. The Lord showed me something amazing that I've never forgotten. And he led me into creation science on that first outreach. Um, that was in 1974 when I finally took the first group of 10 students. We've gone now around 400 outreaches at Price for the Nations Institute around the world to over 70 nations. God had a plan back there with John F. Kennedy when he was assassinated for evangelism. And this is just a little history. What took place after that? That was in 1963 and then 1970 and 1973, how the Lord used mom evangelism, women. He wants women in the ministry. In 1980, Ronald Reagan stepped in and he did what? He brought the end of the Iron Curtain. The Lord used him to bring down the Iron Curtain and God had a plan. You know what that plan was? Evangelism. And he, so Satan came along and tried to kill President Reagan. And we know he didn't make it. And so he continued on. But what happened is, is we became interested in reaching and mom came alive and says, let's build Christ for the Nation Institute in all of these communist countries that where the wall has fallen. So we started schools in Poland, Albania, Romania, Belarus, Bel Bel uh, Bulgaria, Ukraine. And I remember in 19, around 1990, one of our students called me from Romania and says, Dennis, I need you. What for? I want to start a Christ for the Nations Institute there. And I can't start it because the government won't give me permission because I have to have somebody who is reparable and that your Christ for the Nations is the person. And they said, if, they, if the leader comes over from there and signs with you, you can have your schools. And so I did. And the story is amazing. I'm reading through his autobiography, his biography right now. It is amazing of the miracles that this man has seen as he propagate, evangelized Romania. It's powerful. John Delinsky is his name. And if you get a chance, get a hold of that book. It's on YouTube or it's on uh, Amazon. John Delinsky, how he evangelized Romania. Now, what's really amazing is in that same time, 1990, God, my, God invited my brother to go over to begin printing stuff in Belarus, communism. And my brother went over there because it was a lot cheaper to print books and print 
our, our books. In fact, he printed dad's books, my books, by the millions back then. He would print 10,000 of one each of my copies of my books. I mean, I, it was amazing to see that. And, and he, would, he would attach my books on the end of big runs, which were basically free for us. He's still doing that somewhat 30 years later, printing millions and millions of Bibles on that former communist printing company, books and Bibles going into all the world. This is God. He had a plan. When Ronald Reagan came into office, brought down the walls, then the door for evangelism took place. And you know, there were so many organizations that went over to those communist countries and began to reach out on them. And then 2000, President Bush stepped into office. And we know the story of that. 9-11 came about and Muslim suicides around the world. But evangelism of the Muslims began to take on a new level. And if you've heard the story, if you've seen on YouTube, the amazing stories of how so many Muslims are turning to Jesus, it's amazing. God has a plan. Every time Satan has a plan to destroy the church, God steps in and something great is happening. Well, then, 2020, President Trump steps in. I still remember when I was invited to go up to uh, New York City. I said, no, no, I don't like you. I was rooting for uh, our senator here, and he I had prayer with him. And when I went up there and I heard something, I said, oh, my goodness, this guy's got a heart that I can't believe. And when I heard John, John Dobson say, OK, I'm not going to tell you when he was on, on an interview after the three and a half hour meeting where we all got down and prayed, he says, I don't know what's going on but we need to pray for this man because he just gave his heart to the Lord. And he did that on national radio. I said, what? What, is that right, Lord? Well, John, if you know anything about James Dobson, he's not gonna say anything on national radio and television that is in incorrect. So the Lord has a plan. And we see what has happened on evangelism since Trump has stepped in. I mean, what has happened with Israel and then the internet streaming the hundreds of thousands that are now watching church services online that never watched it. And the Lord is forcing us to begin to connect to online streaming so we can watch what God is doing around the world. It's pretty amazing. My sister, Ma's ministry in Israel, the door is open for them to have a new Hebrew Bible and God's TV is now stream. I mean, is now has a radio a television station that, is promoting in Hebrew the gospel message. I mean, it's amazing what the Lord is up to. Now listen to what this prophecy that I told at the beginning, that God is up to something that I still can't quite understand what he's doing at this point in time. But in 1986, I heard this message by David Wilkerson and I said, good, great. I heard so many different, this guy is a loony, he's out in the left field. But here's what he said, 1986. I see a plague coming on the world and the bars, churches, and the government will shut down. The plague will hit New York City and share and shake it like it has never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit and out of it will come a third great awakening that will sweep America and the world. I wonder what part we are gonna have. What part are you gonna have? Do you hear that? New York City, the plague will hit New York City and shake it like it's never been shaken before. And if you know the deaths that's happened in New York City area, New Jersey, it's unbelievable compared to even the rest of the United States. It's unbelievable. Well, what can I say to you but be encouraged and I wanna share with you from our treasure on our board. David Robinson, our CFN board, he shared this and this was on Sunday. And I said, wow, four words that will help you weather this storm and all the storms of life. The summer of 2012 was a season of firestorms across the Western United States. Over 9 billion acres were lost at a cost of more than $1 billion to humans. Wildfires are often scary and dangerous. However, if you are a lodgepole pine cone, 
You can eagerly wait the scorching heat. Those flames bring lodge, lodge poles come cones are tightly sealed. A layer of resin and woody tissue keeps their scales locked tight. They will not open unless exposed to high temperatures, very high temperature that only a destructive forest fire provides. Lodgepole pines are famous for colonizing post-fire landscapes. They love the carbon-rich soil that the fire leaves behind. Seedling pop up almost immediately and bring hope for a new dense strand of trees, stand of trees. Here are four words that will help you weather your personal storms, and they certainly apply to the storm our nation now faces. And they are, number one, steer, two, steady, three, satisfy, and four, sustain. First, we steer our life amid the storm with our tongue. One of the most critical disciplines of your spiritual life is your capacity to guard what you say. Your words should release faith and hope. Direct them to where they are needed most. James 3, 1 hyphen through 12, 1 through 12. Speak about how the tongue is a small and mighty. It's untamed. If untamed, it can set the whole forest on fire. Second, steady. We stabilize our mind, will, and emotions by the words we speak. You can speak words of life or death, a choice you make every day. Most Christians offer praise to God every day for his goodness. However, Hebrews 13 verse 15 talks about the sacrifice of praise. What words do you use when the storms come? Do you have a sacrifice of praise then? Praising God during difficult times is not easy, but the God, our God asks us to. It takes an act of our will and personal sacrifice to believe during the storm, especially when life is not going as we think it should. And that's been happening now for the last couple of weeks. When we choose to praise God despite the storm, he is honored and our faith grows stronger. Number three, your soul is satisfied when you feed on the word of God. Feeding is far more than simply reading the Bible. Feeding is studying and meditating, digging, applying the life principles of God's word. It's like the difference between reading the menu at the restaurant and eating the food at the restaurant. Fourth, sustain. You can only come through the storm and win the good fight of faith when your faith is expressed in answers and not problems. When the object of your faith is the creator of the heavens and the earth and not the circumstances surrounding the storm, you're on your way to victory. Conclusion, never forget, truth always overrides the facts. John 8, 32 says, you shall know the truth and the truth, not the facts, shall make you free free from the storm. Many times the facts of your storm will keep you locked in doubt, fear, and unbelief. Peace and joy comes to those who lean into the storm with deep confidence and faith in the woman who not only allows the storm to come, but they also know he makes their heart beat and their lungs breathe. That's good. Just as the struggle is great for the caterpillar, so it is with those facing life's opportunities, struggles, and storms. The creator of the heaven and earth, the one who turns the struggle of the caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly, will use your storms to create a more beautiful butterfly, a more beautiful you. Just as the lodgepole pine cone needs the intense heat to release its seeds, for now, life there are some things God has buried deep inside you that are only released under extreme pressure and heat, getting rid of all the dross in our lives. So I've seen this time and time again throughout history. The Lord always has a program, a plan to counter whatever Satan's plan and program is all about. And in conclusion, I'm going to show you a little video, not a video, a little PowerPoint presentation that expresses what I'm trying to get across. We are facing a demonic stronghold, and that stronghold is represented in the forces of heaven, Satan, who is out to destroy us, to take our lives. So here we come on this PowerPoint presentation. So 
I think we can all see it now. And I'm going to start explaining it as I go move through it. Probably we'll go pretty fast. Let's see how much time do we have left. All right, 14 minutes. So oh, that's plenty of time. Okay. So, Bash and Bulls, what's that all about? Well, there's an area just to the west, uh, just to the east of the Sea of Galilee in northern Israel. Well, it's a very satanic area, and it's been up until even recently because that is where the Syrians claim it's theirs, the Golan Heights. And of course, when Golan, when when the Syria owned it, they just shelled down on all of the towns on these high ridges until on, on all the Israeli settlements down below until the Six Day War when Israel took it back and. All history shows that that area, even when the children of Israel were coming up from Egypt and into the promised land, that area was dominated by an evil, wicked king, one of Satan's hybrids, King, uh, uh, who am I trying to say? King Og. And if you read anything about King Og, uh, you'll see that he owned that whole area all the way to Mount Hermon on the Golan Heights. Uh, this was a terrible, wicked place where demon activities. Uh, it's even the area where Jesus cast the devils out of that man and then the devils said, let us go into the pigs and you know the rest of the story. That was in the same area, on the Golan Heights. So this area has always been known for demonic activity and I'm trying to share what something that I learned in the Old Testament and has to do with these bulls. If I can get this thing to work, yeah. Is that working now? The bulls of Bashan, Psalms 22. Well, I'm gonna have to use this, I guess. Psalms 22, verse 12, is a prophetic verse in the Old Testament sharing about what it's gonna be like with Christ, uh, during the Passion Week, during this week, when the Lord goes to the cross. And what's interesting is that these bulls, of course, they're not evil, but the demons are evil. And they, this passage shares that the bulls, the demonic forces of, of the Golden Heights up there in, in the land of Bashan, Bashan, which is the way it's said, uh, they were the demons that harassed Jesus on the cross. So the bulls of Bashan, represent the demonic forces that wanted to remove all of God's plan of redemption for us on the cross. He wanted to invalidate it. And that's the same thing. God, you would think the battle was over when Jesus rose from the dead, but it's not over. It's a cleanup is over. I mean, the, the taking the keys is over, but the key cleanup is still going on. Satan is still here and he's still out to destroy God's plan of redemption in our lives if he can get us to. So the demons come along in our lives like now. So you want to play games. And we see these in uh, some of these things that we know about different parts of the world where they celebrate the bull. Well, something terrible is you start playing with the devils and the demons, you're in trouble. Come on, Christian, the devils say. You think you've got the power? Well, Psalms chapter 22, if you get a chance to see that, the death of Christ is all the way through Psalms 22. The very things that he said on the cross were said there in Psalms 22. So Bashan and the cross, I think we understand what's going on there. Psalms 22, 12. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Who are these strong bulls? Well, or was it the Romans? Uh, was it the Pharisees? Well, guess what? It was the demons beyond that. And the Lord says, my enemies surround me like a herd of bulls in that passage. Fierce bulls of Bashan have hemmed me in, Psalms 22, 12. So are you aware? There's a movie being played right now, Star Wars. Now starring, guess who? Recognize that guy? is now playing. Planet Earth was in the hands of Satan. Yes, there is a cosmic war going on. And it's all about what? Taking us out of the game. 
And you've seen pictures like this where someone was hit hard and they were had to be carried off of the field. Something happened that wiped them out. Satan wants to do that with each of us. There's a war going on in the heavens. And if you look at just in the last three months, oh my goodness, the worldwide deaths, well, it's gone up now, what, to 75,000 people since even March 25th? It's unbelievable. And the deaths of this flu in the last three months, malaria, suicides, traffic fatalities. This is in the last three months, HIV, alcohol, smoking, cancer, hunger. But look at this last one. By abortion, nearly 10 million worldwide abortions in the last three months. Satan is having a field day, you would think, especially in the light of all the things that we know about concerning world population, births this year, 34 million. I mean, it doesn't look like much that the devil's doing, but he's out. He's out to take each one of us out. Deaths today, 66,000 deaths are worldwide around the world. So Satan is out to take us all out. No big thing, just because there's a virus. There's been all throughout history. The main thing is you better know your Lord. You better know healing, the power and the curse, that the, the power of the tongue, the curse, the devil. When he comes, yes, there's a war going on out there. It's cosmic chess. And Adrian Rogers said it this way, be warned from Satan's viewpoint, you are a pawn in his game of cosmic chess. So it is cosmic chess. Which one are you? We are the believer and we have the power to knock his block off, right? So there's a countdown to eternity. It's a battle of evil for the souls of mankind. Cosmic chess war. Satan is the king out there in the demonic realm, the old dragon of the air that we read about. The serpent who seeks the souls through deception, and it's all about what? Cosmic treason. High treason. Why the war? Genesis 3, Job 1, Daniel 12, Ephesians 6, Revelation 13 tells us the war in the heavenlies is between the forces of God and evil. The root of the conflict, what's the root of the conflict? I want to be God. You said in your heart, I will ascend. I will raise my throne. I will sit in the throne. I will ascend above. I will make myself like the most high. Then he says to the Lord, bow down to me. And what did the Lord say? Get out of here. You want to give me all of this? It's mine. <laughs> you may think it's yours. So you think it's a great deal, huh? Big deal. Yes, yes, yes. Be careful. What Satan's up to. Wait a second. Having a little problem here. Let me exit and see if I can get this to work. One moment. In show. Hold on. Okay. Now. If we bring this up, there we go. Yes, yes, yes. Wait a second. Oh, einer geht zu Boden und er tut das, was man in so einer Situation am besten machen sollte. Oh, it's not working on yours very well, but. Hier denkt, das ist mein Gefühl. Hier hat ich die Hosen an und du nicht. Und dich will ich auch noch nachts sehen. Okay, you didn't see that real good. But let me tell you, this guy was a drunk. He'd been drinking, they said, and he got depanced. And the bull now has his underwear on his horn. The guy was depanced. The warning that I'm trying to say to you is don't get caught with your pants down. Depancing comes from guess what? Demonic, demonic foul play. Well, you, these aren't working real well. 
but it's known as spiritual warfare. Spiritual blindness, which comes from what? Can you imagine how you're spiritually blind? You're malnourished, dehydrated, oxygen depleted. If you're not eating, if you're not drinking, if you're not breathing, guess what? You're spiritually blind. If you're not eating the word, drinking the word, problem, you got to read the word of God. Here's a lesson from the, the, the disciples that Jesus shared on spiritual blindness. He says, now be, be aware, be careful. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and even of Herod, the king. Be, be leaven. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod, Mark 8, 15. The disciples get between themselves and they begin to ask, what? What's he talking about? Oh, we don't have our bread. We forgot to bring bread along with us. And Jesus says, hey, you nincompoops. <laughs> I don't think he said that, that. Don't you remember the loaves and fish, the feeding of the four and the 5,000 and all of the baskets left over of food? You think I'm talking about physical food? The disciples did not have spiritual eyes to understand what Jesus was saying concerning the Pharisees bread. So the disciples, guess what? Couldn't understand what Jesus was saying. Jesus finally says, you think I'm talking about food? Wake up. So I ask you, how's your spiritual eyesight? The Bible, a spiritual book written by a spiritual being for you and me. We are spiritual beings. A spiritual book written by a spiritual being to you and I, spiritual beings. So how's your blind, how's your spiritual sight? Are you spiritually blind to the Bible? Spiritual blindness steals our understanding. You'll not be able to understand the Bible if you are spiritually blind. You may understand this and that, but you won't understand the full content of what the Lord is saying. And the real reason is, if you're a natural man, guess what? You cannot understand the Bible. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but people who aren't spiritual can't understand and receive what God's spirit is saying. It sounds foolish to them. You ever heard anybody say that? Oh, that's foolishness. It's the spiritual blind cannot understand what the spirit means. There's a cosmic war going on out there. We are in a battle. It's about spiritual warfare. The warfare of coming against God's word. Satan wants to take out anything to do with God's word in your life. So you must establish in your life the word of God to defeat the enemy. And especially in a time like this that the world is facing in our country as well, who is attempting to disrupt your life, our life, my life. The Bible is full of spiritual symbols. And only spiritual eyes, if you have them, can understand and see them. For example, we've all read this story when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, the bread of heaven came down every day. They had water from the rock. And if you don't understand spiritual symbols, you won't understand that, the rock, the water. But we read, Paul tells us, brothers and sisters, while they were in the wilderness, there was a cloud that guided them and baptized them. And they ate spiritual food and drank spiritual water. And they drank from the spiritual rock, who was Christ. So Paul is saying, do you have spiritual eyes? Can you see that, that Jesus is the rock where the water? So if you don't read the Bible with spiritual eyes, you are not gonna be fully able to understand it. And it takes spiritual eyes to understand the Bible. So if that means you better have spiritual eyes that demands spiritual understanding and ears if you're gonna be involved in warfare. Biblical literacy caused by not reading the Bible and it said this, eight out of 10 people in your church will not read through the entire Bible. They'll read parts of it, they'll listen to it, they'll quote the scriptures when pastor is saying something. That leads to biblical illiteracy. 
if you are not reading the Bible. And the result is what? Spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness is called by what? Being mal malnourished, dehydrated, and oxygen depleted. You got to have the Bible, 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 the diet of the carnal Christian. The Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 3, you're worldly, a carnal Christian. And this leads to what? Spiritual blindness. And you're going to be depants if you're not careful. Spiritual depancing. Parable of the seed, Jesus comes along and says to the disciples, do you understand this? The parable of the seed? And they said, we don't understand it. And Jesus said, you don't understand this parable? How are you gonna understand any of the other parables I'm sharing? That's kind of interesting. The fowl of the air, they represent the thieves, the demons, they come and steal. Can you imagine if all these were demons and they were loosed out there to eat the fresh seed that's just been planted? Newly planted seed, and we've seen fields like this just planted, just changed. And here they are, birds, fowl, eating the planted seed. And then Satan will do the same thing. They'll come in and steal it from your heart. We do all the things in the natural to try to keep the birds of the air to try to stop eating the seed. We do it in the natural. We put up nets. We try to do that with ourselves. But again, if you don't have the right watching, Spiritual eyes, you're not going to be able to. Demons are bread sharks. And whoever did this, I don't know. Please do not feed the sharks. Home of the bread shark. Who are the bread sharks? It's Satan. He comes to steal the bread of life, the word of God. These are the fowl of the air. The Lord says they're snatchers of the word of God. They represent fallen angels, demons, who come and steal. Mark chapter four, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So listen from the Holy Spirit, the fowl of the air, they come and steal. And when an evil spirit comes and does not fall, I'll return to the house I left because I'm lonely out here. So a person that's been delivered from the evil ones comes back. He sees it clean and swept. Nothing in there, no word of God, no power of the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? Oh, I'm going to come back. It's clean and swept. It's put in order. And he, what does he do? He comes back and he sees it and he what? Satan says, come on in. And he brings back with him something far worse. A bunch of demons. Oh, my. Oh, my. And they're worse. And what's interesting, someone put out this out, chemical medical meaning of Matthew chapter four. When an evil spirit, chemical, toxin, comes out of a man, it goes through the places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house occupied, swept clean and put in order. And then he brings seven other evil spirits, chemical toxins, more wicked, poisonous than itself. And they go and live there. The final condition of the man is worse than the first. What happens if a man is delivered from all of the drugs that he's been taken, but he doesn't really enter in and fill his life with the word of God? Guess what? The demon comes back and he'll bring more. And the person will get more hooked on to more drugs and worse drugs. And he finds himself in a worse condition than he was before. Jesus explains the birds of the air. They're the prince of the power of the air, Satan. They're demons. And they come to steal the word of God from our hearts when the seed has been sown. Understand. So seven insights for receiving and maintaining spiritual perception. Stay in the word. Sow the word in your life so that the word remains in you, stays in you. Insight one, read daily the word that comes from heaven. God breathe. All scripture is God breathe. Number two, dig the word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Dig, 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 dig. All scripture is inspired. Study the book of instruction continually. And God will become intimate with you and disrobe. Disrobe, God, yeah. The more closer you are intimately with your spouse, with the person you're married to, guess what? In your love, you disrobe. God will do the same thing. And what that means is he disrobes of scripture. He leads us into intimacy with himself and he gives you new revelation out of scripture. That is amazing if you spend intimate times with the Lord. He leads 
to intimacy with God. Number three, drink from the word of God. I think that's understandable. It's living water, rivers of living water. The word of God is fresh water for you. To a thirsty soul, if you're thirsty, word of God, drink from it. And I will become a spiritual living well in you. Can you do that? Come, let me enter into the waters of the Lord. So drink daily from the word of God. Number four, breathe the word of God continuously. Breathe the breath of God. Breathe it. God's going to breathe back on you. And God will breathe on you and give you new insights. He said, receive the Holy Spirit to the disciples. So the word of God is breath from heavenly God. Receive the Holy Spirit, breath of life, God breathe. God breathes, God's breath will open up your understanding of the word of God in a new and wonderful way. So read the Bible every day, watch what God will do. He'll reveal two things to you. If you walk in it daily, guess what happens? You'll grow, you'll not die. Number five, turn on the word. Turn on the light and watch me, which means walk in the light of God's word. And so do you know, Einstein's theory of relatively proposed that the closer you get to the speed of light, the more time slows down. And if you get closer to the source of light, God, the source of light, guess what happens? You're spending more time with him. More time with God gives you supernatural light to resolve problems, sicknesses, diseases, viruses, which means in order to get closer to God, you must, must do what? You must obey, obey the word, read it, destroy all the evil things in your life of your past around you, destroy everything from your life. Larger and stronger than you, Deuteronomy 7, get rid of all those things that the evil people around you have brought in. You must destroy them totally, no mercy. You must get rid of all demonic activity, satanic garbage in your life. Throw it out into the garbage pit. Choose today whom you will serve. You prefer the gods of your ancestors served before the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Has a guy trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel? He lays down. He's removed the high places, the wicked things, and he trusted the Lord. And the Lord came, and suddenly there was an amazing miracle that took place. Whenever you get rid of those things, victory comes. And the last insight, number seven, speak and pray the word. Pray one violent prayer a daily. We have been looking at the demonic battle. We are facing. Jesus didn't become involved in the political controversies of the day. Jesus dealt with the demonic conflict in Israel and roundabout. He cast out demons. And I believe this is the same for us today. We're not to get involved with all the political activity and the conflicts in the world. Rather, we are to involve ourselves with the demonic conflicts that we face day to day. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And remember to wear the proper attire. I don't know if this will show, but this guy lost his pants during a wedding. Can you imagine if that happened? If, <laughs> oh my, at the marriage supper of the Lord, Matthew 22, 11. But when the king came in and looked over the dinner guests, he saw a man who was not dressed with the right outfit. And guess what happened? He was kicked out. Heaven is fighting for us. The war is fierce. Spiritual warfare. Are you ready for the battle? Stand, and Jesus will provide the victory that we're facing here. The war is over, but the cleanup is still in progress. The believer's spiritual claws, the believer's spiritual teeth to devour the serpent's lies and temptations. All scripture is believed, breath of God. Jack Hayford, the Bible is as necessary to spiritual life as breath is to natural life. There's nothing more essential to our lives than the word of God. So the seven insights for receiving, read the word, dig in the word, drink the word, breathe the word, 
Turn on the word. Walk in the word. So if this can happen in the light, this was a wedding. A guy tripped. And look there. They're down in there. <laughs> the bride. Oh, don't let, don't. You can see it. It, it was not put on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If that can happen in the light, can you imagine what can happen in the dark? Number six, obey the word. Completely destroy all the garbage from your lives. And number seven, speak and pray the word. By the way, do you know how to depend the devil? Pray at least one violent prayer a day. That came from my dad. When I heard my dad praying as a child, yelling and screaming, I go in there, my mom was in there sometimes. Sometimes there was not. But who is he screaming at? The devil. He was faced so many problems with the many ministers that he's working with and the problems that they had that he would constantly pray a violent prayer. I've learned to do that. I get out when there's a problem going on in the ministry that I'm aware of in my life. I go around and I pray violent prayers walking out there, praying against the demonic forces, praying in the spirit and watch what happens when God shows up. Demons flee. They're destroyed. And I take it by force. And that's what I'm saying to you. Seven insights, the word, read, dig, drink, breathe, turn on, obey, speak, pray, and watch spiritual growth occur in your life and watch what happens. Giants of the word of God. The word of God is alive and powerful. There you have it. So it's time to wrap this up. If I can figure out how to get out of here now. Come down here. Okay. Come on. Stop presenting. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. Whoops. Am I back up? I'm not sure. Am I on? I'm not sure. I think I am. Yeah. Okay. I'm still on. So I'm just winding up and I'll pray right here as we close up. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we rebuke the powers of darkness. We curse you, Satan, in our lives. You will have not have any virus, any sickness. We rebuke you in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask for peace and rest for all the listeners in spite of what's going on in our lives and the many unknown things we know that in time you work out. And may we understand evangelism. It's all about evangelism. Our duty is to continue on, to carry out evangelism in whatever way you show us now that we are in a name-changing game. You changed, Satan changed it, but your change is better and more effective. Pray this for your glory, Jesus. Amen, students. Be blessed until the next Pillars class. And everybody said, amen. Okay, man. Got to come up here, down here, over here, and we turn off. We stop recording.